everybody a little bit about Angel's Paws. So thank you, Lisa. We started in uh, 2010. And when I started, actually, I was a one-man show. This is one of those deals where uh, I wore every single hat in my, my business. But I, as a pet parent, went through a very significant loss with my 18-year-old cat, Cagney. And I just found that the traditional veterinary model was, you know, void of what the human pet parent needed in that process, which was a lot of support and education. And so when I went through my, my loss, I looked around for the support, it wasn't there. And so then I knew I had to invent this and uh, just kind of set my mind to it. I, it took me six years to get Angel's Paws open. I say 13 and a half years later, we've served over 25,000 pets and people wow. now in the process. I have a very big, amazing staff. There's about 20 of us. We have um, 10 uh, silver Priuses on the road. So we are, you know, we have grown and we are able to get out and just deliver this very, very, very special goodbye to families. Oh, it's so wonderful. Tell us about some of the services you offer. So, you know, 13 and a half years later, we are still a one of a kind in the entire country because we do everything under one roof. And there is no other service anywhere in the country that does all of these services I'm about to name to you under one roof. And that is we can enroll a pet into pet hospice when that bad news is delivered. We then can give a beautiful goodbye from home for that pet with home euthanasia. We personally then bring that pet back to our facility where we provide the cremation services so the pet never leaves our care. We then have two ch beautiful chapels where families can come in and pick up their pet's ashes from us, which is also a great learning opportunity for children to come in and experience what it's like to uh, receive the ashes of a loved one and begin learning that process so that when it's a, a human family member, they may have had some experience with that at that point. And then we have um, a we have aftercare for the human. We have three pet loss support groups, and we also have one-on-one -on -one grief counseling. So those are all of the services that we provide under one roof. That's huge. What a spectrum. I love how you talk about normalizing the death and um, that whole process. And we're actually going to delve into that a little But That's probably part of why you wanted to do this book. Tell everybody about that. Um, it, you know, that's exactly why I wanted to do it because there were, um, you know, there were children who I envision needing to have the um, support of, of a, a place like Angel's Paws. And so when I first started, I had a children's bereavement center set up in my building, and we offered free pet loss support groups for children as well. What I kind of discovered in that process was that pet loss tends to be an adult problem more than a children child problem. Um, adults are the ones who are true caregivers of all of the entities in their home. They have to care for the pet who is sick. They have to then help prepare the children for the, the impending death once that news comes. They have to grieve the loss of their pet themselves. So the adults have so much going on when it comes to pet loss. And children tend to be a little bit different. They're very resilient and they have often been told you can't pay, play with the older pet because they're fragile and they might, you know, kind of nip at you because they're painful. And so they've had to stay away from that older pet for a while. And so they're kind of ready to move on, unfortunately. And that's kind of a double hit for the adult pet parent who may have had this pet longer than they had their children. So they're really grieving. And it's very, very difficult 
So um, uh, can I go ahead and share like where Gaining Wings came from? Yeah, absolutely. What I'm sharing right now. And that is that while adults tend to have the, you know, the bigger issue, that doesn't mean that kids are getting away scot-free and it's just no problem. They grieve and they grieve in their own different way. And because of the age differences of the kids who may be in the family with that adult who's also trying to cope with that loss, they are grieving and understand death differently at their different age groups. And so the, the, the parent of both the pet and the kids have a lot going on, a lot to figure out. And they're trying also to make sure that that pet is comfortable in their new terminal illness or just their old age process. So, um, so I had a client who was a very interesting person. I have many, many clients, by the way, who are very, very interesting people. Angel's Paws is so very blessed because anybody who comes to Angel's Paws are very, very special parents. They absolutely, the one thing that Angel's Paws clients all have in common is that they all love their pets as family members. And as a result, Angel's Paws treats their pet as a family member all the way through. But one of our, one of our clients was Joel Altman. And Joel had a dog named Kurt. And Kurt was his assigned to him when he worked for the FBI and he was a service dog and so they went through they had moved away from Washington they were back in Cincinnati at the time when it was unfortunately time for Kurt to cross the Rainbow Bridge and and Joel used Angel's Paws and he loved the service and the goodbye the meaningful goodbye he was able to have with his amazing beloved Kurt that he came to me afterwards, and Joel is a police officer. He, he does a lot of things. But little known fact, Joel Altman is an author of many children's books. And he came to me and said, Tammy, you know, I was thinking that maybe if you were interested, I would help you co-author a book on helping children cope with the loss of a pet. And I was like, oh, my goodness. That would be an amazing tool for these pet parents who I was just describing to you, Lisa, and all the people who are joining us today listening to this, that it would be a tool for those adults who already have a lot on their plate to help bring their children along in the process, get this topic on the table, and help them know and understand what was going on. So I said, yes, yes, yes. I would love to do that. And by the way, while some of the children, you know, while I said they don't get off scot-free. There's, it's a continuum. Some of the kids really do take it hard. I mean, you have to think about it. Maybe they don't even know what life is like without that pet being in their life because the pet preceded them into the family. It's their older sibling, if you will. Yeah. And, um, you know, and the other thing is that child has already learned a lot from this pet because they had to learn how to take care of another being and how to nurture. So they, you know, this pet has a lot of meaning to them. And so being able to provide a tool to the family that would help walk the children through the anticipatory grief that happens when you get the news. You know, there's several stages of grief. There is, um, well, there's, there's, you know, once you have had a loss, there's many stages of grief that you go through. But there is normal grief and there's complicated grief. And there's also something called anticipatory grief. Anticipatory grief happens at any point prior to the loss actually happening. So when a family begins to see the handwriting on the wall, that our pet is moving into the autumn, let's say, of their life, that things are starting to slow down and decline, then that is a perfect time for this book that Joel and I wrote, which is Gaining Wings, to be read to the children and at least get that topic in a gentle way on the table. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. And I, I wish that our family had had something like that when I was growing up because I could have used something and I think my parents could have also. You know, you know can, I, can love... I just say a little tidbit on that, what you just said? Uh, one of one of the people who read the book said said something and said it best 
and they said, actually, this children's book is actually an adult book disguised as a children's book. I agree. You know, in, <laughs> in I terms totally of the benefit, agree. yeah, adults who don't even have children can really be touched in their soul. Well, when we go through the activities, children. yeah, that you list in the book, those are activities that are going to benefit whether you have a child or whether it's just you and going through the process. <laughs> There's so many different things. Let's talk about, first of all, in the, in the very beginning, I love how you're empathetic to the parent. And the first thing you say is put on your oxygen mask first before you can take care of the kids. I think that's a really important tip. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I'd love to. I'd love to. So uh, sometimes with my own staff, I put on a paper bag that has a face on it, and, and it says the words at the bottom, self-care fraud. And the reason it says that is because I personally am a self-care fraud. When you're a caregiver, you are so busy taking care of everybody else that you neglect yourself. And the problem is that when you neglect yourself, ultimately you can neglect yourself so badly that you won't even be here to take care of anybody else. So I have donned this new self-care fraud image for myself as a reminder that if I don't put the oxygen mask on myself, which comes from the airlines, the airlines yeah. say, you know, when you're flying along, if we should have a, a loss of pressurization, the, the air mask will drop from the ceiling. Put it on yourself before you help those around you. Because without oxygen on you, you are not going to be able to put an oxygen mask on anybody else. So really taking to heart what I'm saying is so important. And this book, I hope, is a message to people that you really do have to take care of yourself. The stress that goes along with losing a beloved pet is a skyrocketing stress. And your body is manufacturing toxins all the time. And tears, by the way, are the most healthy and natural way to get those toxins out of your body so that you can think better and you can feel better so that you can take care of your pet and your children in the process, but mainly you. So wonderful. So important. You know, another thing I think people have a really difficult time letting go they just keep wanting to hold on, even though the quality of life of their pet is really dwindling. You talk about how to kind of navigate that and how to recognize. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. That, you know, that goes along with a tool that I talk about in the book that I, I created a long time ago for my Angel's Paws clients. It's called the Rainbow Scale because the number one question pet parents ask me is, how do I know when it's time to send my pet to the Rainbow Bridge? And so I created an acronym that walks pet parents through the quality of life of their pets so that they can have a better idea of when their pet really has stopped living and is not having fun anymore. Because we as pet parents will accommodate that pet for as long. We'll carry them, we'll carry them outside to go to the bathroom. We will do so many things. But their independence becomes so compromised. They cannot do things for themselves. And that creates an emotional pain for the pet. And I don't know about you, but for me, emotional pain is usually more painful than any kind of physical pain that I've ever experienced. So we don't want to dismiss that emotional pain that the pet's going through when they can't get up and go get themselves a drink of water anymore, or when they're going to the bathroom in the house and they know that they don't want to do that, but they can't help it. They really feel bad, and we don't want them to, to have those kind of feelings. So the rainbow scale walks families through that. We're looking for significant changes in their routine as the R. Their attitude, their happiness quotient is the A. I is incontinence, their ability to make it outside to go to the bathroom or down the hall to the litter box. The N is significant changes in willingness to eat and drink. The B is 
breathing, labored breathing is sometimes a sign of pain and families don't always know that. O is obvious pain when they're very restless and they can't settle down and they have a really difficult night. Night, that's obvious pain. And then walking and mobility issues. So that tool can be very, very helpful to families as they're trying to figure out when do we make this call and when do we compassionately help give that little foot, you know, over the, the, the fence into wow. uh, the Rainbow Bridge, a little boost, just a little boost to help them go. Well, and th you know, thank you so much for putting that together because I think that alone is so powerful to help. People really just need to have some guidance and know, am I doing the right thing or am I not? It's a tough, really tough call when you've got a pet that you love and saying goodbye. So yeah, thank you so much for doing that. Um, one other question I have is, you know, kids, like you said, they run the range of how they're going to react. And some kids are younger and some kids are older. When is it okay to really talk about death with them? Is it okay to actually mention that word to kids? You know, kids are just tiny adults. Eventually, they're going to grow into that adulthood and being exposed at this younger age is how they'll navigate those waters best. It's really difficult when they've had no exposure to death or the concept of death until they're much, much older. So I always say that pets are our amazing, amazing partners to pet parents because they can be teachers. If we allow them to join us on that journey and teach our children about the beautiful circle of life and death, they can show us the grace in it and they can do it beautifully. You know, toddlers, little kids to, you know, under five years old, a lot of times they're very oblivious to the concept of death. They really just don't understand uh, anything about it. At about the ages of five to seven, depending on the child, that concrete understanding of the permanence of loss starts to kick in. So, you know, our very, very young children and getting them in on, on every bit of it at an age appropriate amount of time and exposure, um, I encourage it. I also say always answer the questions that your children ask you. Uh, you don't need to embellish, you know, a lot of additional information to them, but if they're asking a question, it typically means they could handle a straightforward answer. So being very straightforward with them is something I also encourage pet parents to do. Oh, that's so wonderful. And in the book, you'll have to get the book, but there's lots of different activities that you encourage families to do together to celebrate the, the pet and what the pet brought to them and the pet's last moment. So that is just wonderful. I really encourage everybody to go out and get a copy of this. If you've got a pet, you're going to be experiencing this at some point or another, unfortunately. Yeah. It's just part exactly. of life. Um, 